Well, hello everyone and welcome to another Build Your AutoCAD IQ webinar. I'm Ryan Bales and I'll be joined today by Alex Pena and Aman. Uh, Bryce will also be on to answer some questions. So today we will be discussing hat and scaling. In, we're going to primarily focus on AutoCAD 2018, but most of what we'll show should apply to LT just in case that question comes up. So again, uh, I'm Ryan. You can see my glorious beard here, and I'm joined by Alex in Boston and Naman in Ohio. And Bryce isn't up here, but he will be answering chat questions as well. A few things before we get started on the webinar. Uh, please feel free to leave some questions in the chat window. We will do our best to answer those in a timely fashion. Uh, this session is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel as always. The uh, links to register for the reminders, post webinar surveys, chat window, that will also be uh, available. So we're going to, uh, a couple things coming up here. The next webinar, September 14th, blocks, attributes, dynamic blocks, then in October, Layouts, printing, and plotting, November CAD content management and customization. And we'll round out the year in December with 3D modeling and rendering. So uh, again, past webinars are available in the webinar playlist on YouTube. And then data sets are also available. You just have to sign up and you'll be able to download those. Um, let's see, some good links here. Getting started, LT and AutoCAD, learn and explore. Uh, just remember that new content is posted here, especially articles uh, under learn and explore. That goes to the AKN page, uh, Autodesk Knowledge Network. And uh, you'll regularly see new articles, blog posts, et cetera, there. Um, also, how fix the service packs. Make sure to download those when they come out. If you have the desktop app, they'll be available there. If not, you can go to your Autodesk uh, management page and download them there as well. Today, we're going to talk about hatches and scaling. Alex is going to go through hatches, uh, kind of the ins and outs. I like to repeat what's up here. It makes everybody happy uh, of hatching. I want to talk about what is scale. We don't really talk about that much. Uh, it comes up quite a bit for us on the tech support side as things get out of scale or uh, um, particularly with the units, um, Alex and I support Plant 3D, very unit-specific version of AutoCAD. So we'll kind of mention scale and units there, just to try to make sure that we cover our bases there. Uh, and then I'm going to jump into what, where, and how is scale used, uh, specifically the scale command, and then some of the other features of scaling. Um, so before we get this started in AutoCAD, I'm going to run a couple polls just so that everybody gets to answer some questions. First, uh, let's do how long have you been using AutoCAD? All right, it looks like the majority is 10 years and then one to five years is the next one. All right, we're going to close this one out, and then uh, let's do another one. What's the current version of AutoCAD and LT everyone is using? Ooh, most of you are on 2018. You now, that makes me happy. I like 2018. Looks pretty much the same as 2017, but some newer features. We're going to go ahead and close this one. And then we'll round out the last two. Uh, how often do you guys use Hatch? It's like most everybody is a daily hatcher. Oh, oh man. Neck and neck. Oh, that's pretty good. I think it's daily and weekly isn't too much different. I should have put minutely. That way I could really catch some of you guys. Some severe hatchers. All right, when I close this one, let's do scale. And this is uh, the scale command specifically. All 
It looks like most of you use it pretty often, but hopefully I'll be able to teach you some cool things about scale. So we'll go ahead and close this. Alex, if you would, please go ahead and start presenting and let's show everybody hatches. Alrighty, uh, thank you so much, Ryan. Um, as he mentioned, uh, we are actually he and I both support Plan 3D. So um, we don't usually use the hatch command as often as um, you folks, it seems. Um, but it, when we do, we'd like to show um, kind of our perspective and things we've learned with the command. Um, I would say that uh, by the looks of it, folks have been using the command for a while. So this webinar will be geared toward more getting familiar with the hatch command and um, getting used to it. And from there, uh, I will actually be creating a supplemental screencast that will kind of capture more complex things um, with the annotative hatches and different ways to troubleshoot. Um, just because on the technical support side of things, we definitely see a whole lot of uh, issues regarding hatches. So uh, the first thing um, folks who don't un aren't too familiar with the program would be asking what exactly is Hatch in AutoCAD. Um, hatch basically uh, fills an enclosed area or selected objects with a hatch pattern, a solid fill, or a gradient fill. Um, you can find the hatch command right here on the home tab, uh, draw panel, and the hatch icon here. If um, I click it here, you'll notice that the hatch creation tab is prompted with this. Um, all the different options that are available to us within the command are displayed here. Um, if I escape, I can also just type in hatch on the command line and hit enter. And uh, from there, I'll be prompted with the exact same um, hatch creation tab. A uh, good question that most folks would have would be uh, why use the hatch command? And I think that um, as every drafter most likely here knows or probably doesn't know, um, if they're new to the program, um, conveying a message through a drawing containing two-dimensional objects can be difficult at times. Um, as opposed to adding in annotations for everything that is being drawn, hatches allow you to bring distinguishable characteristics to plants. Um, everything from grass, sand, uh, concrete, and brick can be used at any point um, throughout the drawings. So um, what we'll do uh, first is kind of get into, uh, this is just an elevation that I, I grabbed up from one of the sample drawings and modified slightly just to create this. And um, the first thing that I'd want to do is hatch this first side here. Um, and the one thing that I do want to bring to most folks' attention when hatching is uh, make sure you uh, zoom in to the entire extent of the object you're trying to uh, actually hatch. Um, the reason for this is AutoCAD uses a ray casting algorithm to analyze what's on the screen when hatching. So um, what it wants to do is recognize the outside boundaries of the areas that you want to hatch. And if for some reason I happen to cut off the top here, it's going to try to find that outside boundary. Um, it's going to actually analyze all the other hatch objects as well, which would make uh, increase the speed of what you're trying to hatch. Um, in some instances, you might not actually hatch the correct area. and might only uh, hatch one of these areas here. So um, what I'll do is zoom into this area to make sure that the uh, full extent is shown. Uh, from here, I'd normally go through and kind of choose the layer I want my hatch to display. Um, this will let us know what uh, properties are going to be inherited by the hatch. Um, since I want to do a brick, I'll kind of just set my layer to elevation brick. And from here, I'll activate the hatch command. Now, uh, a few different things that are shown here. Um, here, I have all the different uh, options for hatches. I have some uh, that are pretty familiar and conventional, such as concrete, architectural concrete, um, some bricks, and also some non-conventional, such as the uh, hex, honey, and gradient um, are displayed here as well. So what I'll do is uh, kind of choose my first pattern. And we'll choose the brick. And uh, the cool thing about the new versions of um, AutoCAD as, as of 2011 or so, everything is displayed here. And they do um, give you a preview of the object that you're trying to hatch. Um, this preview, as you can tell right now, the brick is uh, pretty dense in a sense. So all I'm seeing is a solid fill as opposed to the spacing. What I can do to adjust this is um, just mess around with the scale here. Um, I'll turn it down, we'll turn it up to say 60 and um, hit enter. This kind of activates the scale. And once I preview here, we got a bigger spacing. Um, this is more similar to a cinder block, I'd say, than a brick. So what I do is just adjust this one more time to say something around 20. And from there, we'll get the display that we want. In order to activate the hatch, all I want to do is click on the active area and hit enter. 
from there, the first hatch has been set. Uh, as you can tell, it took into account all the inside areas that I was hoping to find. And um, so that that's not too bad. Really quick, you don't have to actually enter and exit out of any dialog boxes as you previously would in uh, previous versions of the program. And uh, pretty nice and uh, quick. The next one that I want to do is a side panel for this uh, area here. And what I'll do again is just um, change my layers. Um, I know there are instances where folks kind of put all hatches on one layer. In that instance, you'd only have to change the layer once. Um, I personally like to separate it. So, um, and again, it, it's uh, preference based. Uh, what I'll do is choose the ANC 31, 131 here uh, uh, pattern. Set this back to one, just so I can start off with a clean slate. Uh, and from there, again, I'm getting a two, uh, a pattern that's too dense. Um, what I'll do is adjust this slightly and hit 100 or so to get that spacing. This seems like the spacing I want, but um, the direction of the pattern itself seems a little off to me. And um, a way that we can actually adjust this, if I wanted, in a sense, get horizontal stripes uh, or pattern going horizontal, um, I can adjust the angle either by moving the toggle here or by clicking on the um, bar here and just typing in an angle. I'll type in 45 and hit enter, and we'll check out the preview. We're receiving a, uh, a vertical stripe here, which I'm not hoping to see. I'm hoping to actually see the pattern go a little horizontal. So what I'll do is actually add 90 degrees to this, make it 135, and hopefully this kind of gives us what we're expecting. Now in the preview, you can tell that um, this is what I'm hoping to see, but at the top, you can tell there's a little space between the actual finish of the pattern and uh, the top of my, uh, my building um, extension here. So what I'm gonna do is actually set the origin. This will allow us to choose in which direction or what point of, um, of the hatch is going to start. So from here, I'll just set the origin to this top left corner. And now when I actually hover over the pattern, I'll see what I'm expecting to see. Nice, even uh, spaces that allows me to kind of create the, the vision that I'm hoping for. I'll, I'll again, click on the active area, hit enter. From there, I'm actually seeing the uh, hatch pattern as I'm hoping to with the uh, brick, now side panel. And I know <laughs> the, this probably isn't the best conventional uh, method for creating house. So if you had this going on, you probably have the most interesting house on the block. But nonetheless, uh, it does help us uh, understand the different capabilities um, within the program. Uh, one more thing that I do want to hatch is this area here. And um, this area is a little bit more complex for the feature for AutoCAD to try to uh, recognize. We'll notice when we try to use a gravel pattern here that it may not, in a sense, um, take into account the preview correctly. So I'll change my layer one more time. Activate the hatch command. And this time I will search for a gravel pattern. As you can tell, all the layer information is acquired from the previous set. Um, you can check under the properties here that it's currently using the, the layer that it's set to. So all that information is acquired. You can go here and override that for the hatch pattern. Um, so if I wanted to change this, I could. But at the moment, I just wanted to keep it to acquire the information. So the first thing that I'm going to do set up everything back to normal. So set this back to zero, set this back to one, just so I can get a clean start. And from here, um, when I go to actually preview the hatch pattern, I'm not seeing a display. This is that, uh, that ray casting algorithm right now. What it's trying to do is approximate the area that it needs to hatch. With so many lines and boundaries that could be hatched, um, it's having a tough time with the current settings that I've set for the gravel. Um, one scale would normally be, I think, way too dense. And the only way that I can actually figure out is if I zoom out. When I zoom out, uh, the program is going to try to approximate the area. It still can't. And then at this point, it'll probably fill it in there. Um, this is just due to the fact that it's taking into account now what it's available to and um, scaling that proportionately. So what I'll do is um, obviously too dense. Adjust this to about 50 or so. And um, if I did want to, I could always go in here and um, kind of mess with the transparency of the hatch if I wanted to do it as an overlay of some sort, uh, something that I didn't want to actually re represent completely. And what I'll do is here. Okay. 
So the hatch pattern, this is exactly what I'm hoping to see. Um, I'll activate this and hit enter. Um, so now that I have the completed, in a sense, most of this uh, really interesting house, um, well, what I'd like to do is try to, in a sense, if I'm working in a different layer, one thing that I, I always want to mention to folks is if I'm, I'm doing something on, on active work and I've already gone through and hatched some areas, and now all I want to do is take that information and, in a sense, apply it to another area um, now that I've actually constructed it. Um, the, regardless of what layer you're on here, you can always go in and match properties within hatches. So when I activate the hatch command, um, I have the match properties feature here. And, um, for example, if I wanted to have the uh, the uh, over, overhang here to have the exact same gravel, what I'll do is hit match properties. This allows me to choose one of these hatches or any previously defined hatches and inherit the properties on the next area that I want to hatch. Um, I'll select this one. And then from here, I'm actually able to carry it through and hatch any selectable uh, point with the exact same in information. What this allows me to do is apply that there, click and en hit enter. And now these two will have the exact same information as far as uh, layer information, or anything else that I predefinedly set. If I look at the properties set to the elevation gravel layer, the nifty part about this is if I exit out of the command, I'm actually right back to the uh, layer that I was previously working in, um, which can be very convenient when trying to do multiple things at once. Um, uh, uh, there are a few other things. I'll activate the command one more time to kind of just um, encourage folks to go through here and um, choose different settings. Um, one thing to keep in mind with the command itself, it is a sticky command. So um, by default, AutoCAD will always choose pick points, which will determine the points within the inside of a area. But if you wanted to, for example, select your own outside boundaries, um, you can go through here and do that. Um, just keep in mind that if you escape from the command um, and enter back in, it'll default to actually selecting objects again. Um, not the pick points. So uh, something to keep in mind for efficiency. Um, there are folks that uh, who you have been using the program for over 10 years, as they mentioned in the, their uh, poll. Um, they've probably seen this hatching gradient dialog box in the earlier versions of AutoCAD. Um, this was actually removed or changed um, in the 2011 version. So you can't always get this back and um, you can work from here. I personally like to use the ribbon. But um, if you did ever want to bring this back, uh, there is a system variable. Uh, I believe it's HP DLG mode. And uh, what this is hatch pattern dialog mode. Um, by default, it is set to two. Um, you can always go in here, set it to one. And then um, anytime you activate the hatch dialog, hatch command, the dialog box will come to, you have your gradients here, you have your hatches, and some people would prefer to do that. Um, as I mentioned previously, I'm actually not one of those people, so I will actually set this back to two. Um, uh, another thing that uh, folks can kind of, uh, another system variable that comes in handy when working with really uh, complex uh, drawings and objects would be the uh, HP Quick Preview. By default, it is set to on. And that's what we see anytime we uh, select this, uh, say, any, any uh, pattern here. It'll give us that quick preview of what it's going to display, what it's going to look like at the end result. And um, when working with really complex drawings, this preview can actually cause a lag in within the drawing. What you could do is always turn this off. So when you're working with, uh, with in tight areas, in a sense, hit the HP quick preview, type in off. And from here, um, you may not get that actual uh, preview anymore, but just know that the result will actually be what you're expecting for most instances. Um, this can be uh, some issues if uh, there are areas where you haven't actually closed off um, the entire area. So um, the command is only going to be able to uh, go off of what's currently there. So that's the one downside to the quick preview being turned off, but um, that is an option. and stops the model from having to regenerate at any possible command, uh, any possible enclosed area where the um, hatch can be uh, placed. Um, also, uh, a really good trick that we normally recommend folks when using idiot hatches is actually um, turning off the grid. Uh, the grid can be found here. Um, and just with zooming in and out, um, uh, oftentimes folks will, will mention that they're uh, 
their their rent their regen of the model is taking a whole lot of time or a lot longer than what it normally would. It's just that gradient pattern trying to make it through that grid uh, disassociation. So one thing that we definitely would recommend is turn off the grid while um, zooming in and out and working with gradients. And then after the fact, um, you can always uh, kind of turn it back on or continue working in that way. But um, as I mentioned previously, uh, this is basically the ins and outs of the hatch command. I'll personally be going in through and kind of creating uh, additional content for um, hatches and uh, how to basically use annotative hatches to your advantage, which can be um, pretty awesome when trying to print to different paper sizes. I know um, most um, architectural firms will obviously choose different sizes depending on um, different plans and uh, project sizes. So um, that that's something that will definitely be offered after the fact. Um, and uh, what I'll do now is uh, transfer it over to Brian, who will kind of do a larger overview on uh, scaling on his end. Awesome, thank you, Alex. So uh, Alex did mention a couple things in here that were good and Naman briefed over them in one of the questions and that was the scale, which is uh, my portion of this. Hatches have a particular scale built into the definition of the hatch type. Um, I'm not sure where that is actually found, the, the scale definitions, or the, the hatch definitions, but like Naman in the said, file. okay, the, the ANSI 31 has a definition for one point, or 0.125 units apart at one scale. So if you were to scale that up to be, like Naman said, eight inches apart, that'd be 64. So it's sort of arbitrary to your, your actual scale of your objects. If you draw one-to-one, -one, obviously it's going to be much easier for you to account for that. Um, Alex and I did also talk about beforehand one other thing that I thought was pretty neat. If you wanted to split hatches, so you hatch an entire object, neat little command here, separate hatches, that'll actually create four separate hatches. Um, each of these can then be scaled independently of each other. So. That's uh, something to keep in mind when you go ahead and do hatch. So from here, I'm going to jump into scale. Um, this is Alex's drawing. I'm not going to use it as much. I'll do some more practical stuff in here. For the most part, I'm going to be in my completely random drawing just to give a little brief overview of scale. So uh, scale in AutoCAD, as we saw, it appears in hatch uh, and pretty much appears everywhere. So when we have a block, or an object, it has a particular scale. Blocks are pretty neat um, because they are created to a specific scale and then can be scaled up or down relative to their drawing units. Uh, units are very important when we talk about scale because we try to make sure that the scale of an object is relative to the object unit or the drawing units. So it, say if I was using an imperial drawing or decimal, decimal inches, um, which in AutoCAD is a little bit of a misnomer. Decimal is completely arbitrary. Uh, it can be millimeters, it can be inches, it can be miles. Uh, say if we draw objects in one-to-one, -one, which is you can see what my annotation scale is set to, we go ahead and make sure that, you know, say this is 10, well, this is 10 units. Um, if I were to change the units real quick from decimal to say architectural, uh, default units for architectural is inches. So this is now referencing 10 inches. Uh, if it's in millimeters, you would just keep it in decimal, specify that it's in millimeters, et cetera. So scale is going to be really, really important to remember in comparison to the drawing units. So for this example, I'm just gonna keep it in decimal. I'm gonna change the units uh, or the dimension styles. That was an accident, but hey. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and switch Uh, when units comes back to me, we'll switch units. Let's see. Come back to me, units. Oh, well, you never know. Uh, let's just back up. There we go. So, since units didn't want to come back to me, undo came back to me. Uh, anyway, we're going to stay in decimal. Decimal is probably the easiest way to show this just because I don't have to account for different unit types. We're going to show some quick examples. But first, I want to show why we use the scale command. 
Uh, in regular AutoCAD right under here on Modify, we have Scale. So it doesn't really tell you what it can be used for as far as object type. And that's important to remember because we can pretty much scale anything from text to polylines to dimensions if you really wanted to, uh, 3D solids, circles, arcs, pretty much any object can be scaled. Which will be important when we get to 3D solids because there are several commands that do not impact 3D solids like offset, whereas scale does. So we can use scale to our advantage, particularly on 3D solids, to make objects that normally wouldn't be able to be easily, say, offset or copied in a way that is uh, relative to the object's, say, geometric center. So th that will help us in the future to kind of go through that. So I use scale uh, a lot. Planet 3D is a very unit scale specific drawing. So most of the time I'm scaling between metric and imperial. I try to remember the two factors, you know, 25.4, and I think it's uh, 039. 0 0.03934 or something like that to go back and forth. Uh, very important to remember, but the scale command allows us to scale objects without having to do that extra math. And so we get to have certain things like say this polyline right here, if we go ahead and, and we'll throw a dimension uh, from here to here and we can see that this is completely off, um, but it is square. So scale allows us to then scale up this object and we can scale it to match 10. But as you'll notice, the scale command is by your mouse factor. So I could in fact probably guess and get, you know, one point, what is it, 1.7 because it's 0.0 or 0.7 off and match, or I can use reference. So when we talk about scale, we have a lot of different functions to do with it. We can scale by reference, scale by arbitrary, you know, mouse points, if you're just guessing. So the reason we use this command is because we don't have to grab this rectangle and try to stretch it by 0.7 to match where my dimension says it should be. And because it's a square, we, oh, maybe we want to match them both. We don't just want, you know, to be off square. So that's the reason we use scale is for uniformity and to keep the objects consistent. So scale will be very helpful to, to make sure that when you draw an object and it's wrong or you insert an object more often than not, doesn't match your units, you can scale it by a factor or a reference and get it to match. So let's jump into some practical examples. I'm going to show this little circle. One of my favorite ways to scale is by a reference. I'll show it up there on that rectangle too. Uh, I'm gonna pick the center of this circle and you can see that uh, because I'm scaling by the center of the circle, um, you can see my reference point out here, kind of arbitrary. Um, I don't really like that. So I'm gonna actually scale by reference and my reference point will be the quadrant or the intersection of this point right here. So this fixes my scale to my cursor onto a snapped point on the object, allowing me to scale to, let's say this, uh, but we want to match the rest of our circles, and I've um, drawn a construction line to show. So we'll go ahead and scale it to there, and that would be perfect. So that's one very quick example for scale by reference. Uh, we can do it here too. Scaling out, we'll pick reference, we'll draw our line, and we'll go to the endpoint here, making this object a perfect, wherever it is, I uh, didn't say it, uh, 10 by 10. So that's one way of doing scale by reference. Um, I prefer scale by reference because I don't have to have that cursor point out there a ways. Um, and it really allows you to have a very complex 3D object scaled by what it should be, not what it was inserted as. And I find that particularly helpful when I download vendor drawings or, I get a lot of, I used to get a lot of valves from companies that drew in metric. I had to scale them down into imperial units, and that was often easier to draw reference objects for pipe size or whatever dimensions from their data sheets, et cetera. So that, that really helps to scale by reference. Um, 
The reason we also like to, to scale 3D objects is because we can get away with things, like I mentioned, can't offset. So if I want to try to offset this object, I can't. And I'll show you here. So I want to try to offset this, let's say 0.2. So if I pick this, I can't actually offset that. But I can scale this object. So I know what you're thinking. If I scale this object, it'll be permanently scaled, the object itself. Well, my friends, let me show you something cool. If you pick midpoint between two points, we'll scale it by the center of the block. Neat little feature down here, copy. So scale has within it a subcommand for copying. Much like trim has extend or extend has trim, we can copy. So now, if I scale, and I wanted to scale it by 0.2, so we'll do one for the object scale that is, meaning we're not going to scale it twice the size, but one, like 100% of an object, 0.2. So now, if I switch to 2D wireframe, you can see that I, in fact, have two objects in here. I have my original cube and my new cube, which is scaled by 1.2 to give me that offset. So scale really helps 3D objects because you can get away with things where it would be, I'd have to draw a new cube and adjust it where I can quickly just scale copy and make two objects that I needed. And the same holds true for 2D line work where I can scale and copy. Let's say this object is small, but it's actually a size that I need to keep. So we're gonna scale this. And we'll scale it. Um, we'll scale it by here. Now uh, let's just pick somewhere out here. So if we want to go this way, and I want to scale it, let's just say twice the size. If I just do two, it's going to permanently do it. I don't want that. So let's do scale, and a neat little command because I always try to show you guys something previous. So if I hit P, it's going to select the previous selection set. Hopefully I just made someone's day in the crowd because previous is probably the coolest thing that AutoCAD has ever done. So I don't have to pick the objects again. Just do undo, scale previous. We'll pick our arbitrary point. I think I'm not gonna pick an arbitrary point because I'm not a very arbitrary person. So I will go ahead and pick the center of this. I wanna scale it by two, but first I wanna copy. So let's do copy and then let's do two. So now I got both. So that's one of the most effective points for scale is the subset copy in that I don't actually have to modify my original object, but I can actually copy that and scale it by what I want to. Um, that's where scale comes in very handy. And uh, hopefully that finds you guys to be pretty good. My other favorite way of scaling is actually in the grip functions. And I don't know how familiar you guys are with grip functions. Um, I'm gonna show it two different ways. First, let's go ahead and go back to our cube. Um, you can see that, you know, this, here's our, our nice pretty cube. Um, this, oh, this is my block, sorry. Let's go back to the cube. So here's our cube. We have different grips. This allows us to stretch. If you hit enter on a grip, you get different functions. So where it really makes a difference too is like here. So we'll go, our first grip function is stretch. So if you hit enter, then it becomes move. If you hit it again, it becomes rotate. If you hit it again, it becomes scale. So say I'm trying to scale an object. I don't know the reference point, but I do know the grip points. So I, I say, okay, well, I know the center is what I wanna scale from. I can pick the center grip, enter my way through scale, and then that's my scale base point. So I can quickly scale there, and again, you can see, I can now again reference here to here, and I can then copy, and we'll go ahead and just scale it out. And a cool thing about scale reference copy is that I got multiples, so I can basically use this as an offset function as well. And that means don't have to enter too many commands, I don't have to mess around with different specifications, find parts, like base points. I can just pick my base point that I already know exists, 
and we can go ahead and go through it. We'll do copy, we'll do reference, and then we'll just come out. We'll do 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 you know, we'll just, we can go way out 1.3, and then, you know, that's basically an offset where I don't have to worry too much about selecting it. So very, very useful. I believe the same works for, yeah, for 3D solids as well. Uh, you can see here I can rotate objects, uh, and then I can also scale. And again, I can scale copy, and we can do reference. And we do 1.2 or whatever we want to do. And it scales our little tiny cube. So remember that the if you pick a specific dimension or, or value from a reference, it's going to be a reference based on that size. So that's an important part to remember. So that's probably the two biggest features in scale I like to show in model space. Uh, the last one, I think, for the third option would be, let's go ahead and scale some text. Um, text actually has its own scale. Uh, you can see scale text. You could use scale too. But scale text works specifically for text objects, which is kind of neat if I'm trying to scale all the text in the drawing. I can pick scale text, and uh, it only found one. So I'm not scaling everything, I'm just scaling the text. So I don't have to scale all the objects. If I just wanted to scale all my text up by 1.1, I can just go ahead and pick scale text, and it'll filter out objects based on text objects, M text, D text, et cetera. Uh, we gotta pick our point. Existing point would be the base point of insertion. Uh, M text is gonna be very specific here because you get the option of justification on just about any value you want. I don't stick with existing. So scale is a little bit interesting in that the scale factor we can pick, we can match another object, we can fix our paper height, or we can see that it says new model height. That refers to, the, you know, if we were, it's, it's good 0.2 for example, it's going to scale it down to a text height of 0.2. So the text height and scale factor are a little bit interesting here. That refers to the text height. So if we were to do the same command, pick our object, pick existing, and I wanted a text height of six inches, you could do that. And you can see, you go into properties, text height is six. So scale text is pretty neat in that you don't have to guess. You know the height because it's asking you how tall you want it. Do you want it one eighth of an inch? Do you want it two inches, three inches? Scale text allows you to enter those values without having to enter a scale factor based on the object's size. So if I wanted to scale this by, to make it two inches, I would need to scale it by one third of its current value. Or I could do scale text and scale it down and say, make it exactly two inches tall. So that's where I prefer scale text for scaling text. It works really well for multiples. If I have 40 of these are scattered around the drawing and I wanted them all to be a different height, I could scale them by their justification points, a certain value, and scale all text instead of having to select all text and change height, um, which is very similar, but I, I find scale text to be very quick. Uh, you did see some other features in here. When we pick our text object, we can paper height, uh, paper height says that's what our based on our new paper height is going to be. I don't use that very much. I think that would be much more helpful in your viewport. And if we did uh, match objects, so say if I had another object up here, and we'll just do this the cool way that's not scale but similar, two, and we'll do scale text, and we'll pick our, our scaling object, existing match object. Fix text object, boom, matches that object. So that works really well. If you've got text that uh, the size is smaller than your precision is set to, which I've seen when you use, say, 330 seconds and your, your unit precision is set to, say, an eighth. So everything looks to be an eighth because it's rounding it up to an eighth, but really your text is 0.9375. So you need to scale it by object versus by value, and that gets the exact match. Or you set your precision in units higher and then go that route. Oftentimes it's much quicker just to scale by an object. And the last one we saw in here is scale factor. Now this is where you can actually use the scale factor 
instead of a text height, which would basically be just using the scale command as is and not scale text. So while can be useful if you're trying to fill an object size and you only want to filter out text, it's basically just scale. Uh, and that's, it is what it is, I guess. If you need to use that, you need to use it. I don't find any reason to use that just regular scale command, but again, unless you're trying to filter out text. So from here, let me glance, just make sure there's no outstanding questions that hey, I need Ryan. to answer. Yeah. Hey, so I use this uh, scale factor type uh, scaling objects with uh, bringing in uh, JPEGs or TIFF files that I want to yes. do free. It works awesome. I'll just draw yes. a line that matches the points, and I'll say, hey, this line needs to be five feet or four feet. So it, it, right. it's an awesome tool for that purpose. Yeah, very good for inserting objects, OLEs, JPEGs, bitmap. In anything that's inserted will have a different scale. And that's why, I see, I have my block here. That's the last thing I was going to go over. It has a particular scale in units, too. And so if I were to insert this object, say if we delete this guy and then reinsert that box, you know, it can be inserted by a specific scale. So if we switch that, we'll specify on screen. Um, so if I, I can insert this at twice its normal size right off the bat. So what's very good is when you're trying to scale, do you know match that scale of text, like Naman was saying, scale factor works really well because now I can match an existing object. So you know we switch switch this out to two. Now we insert this object twice its normal size, and then if we go into properties, it should say two. Um, we can go back to one and do it. The cool thing too to remember is blocks allow you to scale non-uniformly. So this block is not set to scale uniformly. So I can scale uh, 60 times on the X, and that's basically uh, you know, 60 times larger, which is about a 10, 10 square or so. Um, or if you need the objects to say 100% uniform, we'd actually do that in block editor. Uh, if you select the, the scale uniformly on block creation, it would actually set this option right here to yes. If you did not enter block editor without any object selected, select properties and under scale uniformly select yes. And we'll go ahead and save this. Now when we come here, the options for Y and Z will be grayed out and X is the only one we can enter. And if we enter three, it will scale the object 100% uniformly. That's a pretty neat thing about blocks. Uh, so. Those are all really cool things to keep in mind. Text scale, uh, scale copy, grip scales, references, and of course the 3D scale uh, allowing you to create new objects. And I find copy and scale to be inseparable that way. Uh, it's much easier than to me than doing that. There's also 3D scale. Uh, it's basically the same as 2D scale, but meant for 3D objects. It could, there's this cool little gizmo in here, which I think is the exact word for this. I thought that was always pretty neat. Because um, we can, I think, yeah, you relocate gizmo. See, you guys thought I was joking. In fact, AutoCAD has a gizmo. So uh, the gizmo has rotate, move, and scale. And you can pick the particular scale. You can also do scale factor, as Naman pointed out. We can, again, do copy. It, and the other commands from normal scale. Scale works the same way. The, the difference being when you 3D scale, the gizmo is built to the object's center. So for this, it's the perfect center. So whereas I had to pick the midpoint between two points and pick the diagonal from the corners, 3D scale automatically picks that point. Um, I can verify the base point by just hitting return. Um, that will allow me to move the base point. Uh, so if you don't want to do that, you know, leave the base point as is. You can see that on my object, the base point's already there. And when you select a 3D object, you should get the gizmo anyway. Um, and again, we can filter through to get to scale. You can see the scale gizmo arrived there. Copy reference is there. Undo is also there, pretty neat. And exit, so we'll go ahead and exit. And I wanna round out scale, talking about viewports real quick. Uh, viewport scale. Probably one of the biggest things that Bryce and Alex and I'm sure Naman and I see all the time is uh, objects in a viewport not being scaled correctly. 
very important to remember if you're drawing it one to one and your viewport is a specific sheet size it has a specific scale that scale is found here viewport scale and annotation scale must be the same in order to print correctly you'll get a warning if you try to print with a different annotation scale so if we draw our objects at one to one and our does not fit on our viewport we would need to match the scale to fit i do one to two because they're pretty small uh, you could go one to four that moves them out further or one to one probably too large actually so this is very important for using uh, paper space is scale so keep in mind when you scale objects and model space and paper space try to remember when you create your viewport a viewport is a window and objects in the window need to be a specific size and they should be an exact size so custom scale not really good unless you're not going to dimension it but if we go ahead and just do this fit most of our dimensions in here um, I have the defaults turned on which will allow you to scale objects automatically so we can still get this as 10 uh, even though I know based on 1 to 2 this would actually not be 10 in paper space it's is much larger than 10 or less smaller than 10 sorry because this is like a uh, what a d size sheet so that's one thing to remember dimensions are by default to auto scale to model space objects and uh, I think that just about rounds it out so make sure when you do viewports through layouts check your scale on your viewport um, select the viewport um, if you go into the viewport you can see it you can select the viewport go to properties it'll show you as I mentioned before let's, let's go ahead and do that since my viewports in the back I'm just going to use quick select because it's pretty neat so we'll select our viewport we can see that annotation scale is here standard scale is here if we change the standard scale that's the objects the annotations themselves would be at a larger scale since these are fixed to each other you one will affect the other unless you were to shortcut that do not recommend that every once in a while that comes in and it's just it's such a nightmare to try to print with a different annotation scale especially if you're using annotative objects Alex didn't go in to go annotative text annotative or uh, hatches annotative text and hatches if you change the annotation scale it, it's gonna get really wonky so just try to make sure that these stay the same very hard to get them separated just keep them the same that's probably my biggest point I want to drive on those uh, is there any questions yeah. come on yeah Ryan hey uh, Linda's wondering if you could please show the reference uh, again how to do the reference thing when you I scale will. and then the one other trivia question I'd like you to answer see if you, you uh, it shows my age it does uh, what is the actual command that that scale that you were changing of the viewport what command is it using actually in the old days I think that's VP scale isn't it uh, no it actually in the old days old, older days than that it's the zoom basically you are zooming oh, and panning. You're right yeah yep. so, uh, Ward um, Mr. Ward uh, or Miss Ward I don't know <laughs> you mentioned that and I, I was gonna to ask you hey this is the zoom command that you use that's why it doesn't affect the actual objects it's just what right. you're doing is that you're zooming in and out uh, right and that's uh, easily more, more most easily seen in the maximize viewport function when we open the viewport it opens a visual you know a, a view into model space we can see it's basically just zoom so if we switch it back down it's going to go back to where it was viewports I, I like to call them windows because the objects through the window um, are always going to be the, their exact size but if I put a magnifying glass in front of the window or a telescope or binoculars or I flip binoculars around the objects in the window will be smaller or larger respectively so that's one thing to remember about viewports they are not scaling your objects they are zooming and panning to fit them to a specific scale so yeah that's good I forgot I had forgotten to yeah. that's how that and works. the reference option please Yes, reference. So uh, we're going to go ahead and we're just going to scale this object that I doubled here and copied. And I'm going to scale it based on a reference point. As you can see, I have a good starting point here with my circle. So we're going to go ahead and pick this. I'm going to deselect or deselect these objects by uh, holding shift. 
if you didn't know that, pretty sweet. So now my selection set, excuse me, is these objects here. We will scale by the base point of this circle. And our reference point, since our two circles should line up, we'll go ahead and do reference. We'll pick the center and the quadrant, and then we'll go down to the quadrant, and we'll zoom out, and we can see that it's exact. Uh, bonus question, how do I get rid of duplicates? Anybody? Anybody? Oh, all right, that's right, you guys can't talk. Overkill. Cool little feature here. I've gone over this in past webinars as cleanup tools. I always like to remind people of a few little cleanup tools and added bonus. Uh, this That's just because I like you guys so much. Duplicate objects, let's delete them. Okay, now we should have one circle here instead of two circles. And I'll back up and just show you that I was super right when I said I did that. Two circles, overkill removes them. Um, that's scale by reference. Obviously, you can scale by any reference point. It's very good to pick a point which it easily matches, if that makes sense. So if I were to try to scale these by, let's just say, this, and then set a reference, um, I picked an arbitrary start point. So when I scale by reference, it's not going to be very accurate. So try to select your base point relative to how the object reference is going to be. And what I mean by that is, We'll jump midpoint between two points. We'll pick between our two circles. That's the exact center. So now when I reference, um, we'll do the same point. And this gives us that exact point to this line. So now if I wanted to scale it by one quarter or 0.25, I have a very exact point to go from versus if I just pick an arbitrary point We'll do previous again, just because I love to show that. And we just go reference. Uh, we'll just pick here to here. You know, 0.25, that's way out there somewhere. That's just not, and you can see that the object isn't aligned properly. So the base point and the reference point are incredibly important for accuracy. So scale is quite easy to get off. Make sure to pick your base points properly and your reference point properly. So is that everything to mon, or do you want me to? Uh, I think that was, uh, uh, some people had, uh, one person had mentioned uh, in when you ta were talking about units, uh, and it's mm -hmm. that uh, changing, converting units from inches to millimeters is a two-step process. And one, you set it to decimal, and then you have to scale it, actually. And I kind of yes. posted a link to the help page uh, showing how to convert those. Right. Uh, and that's important to remember too, because uh, when you, a good fair portion of us probably draw in units. Oh, let's see, where is that? Hey, I got units back. Uh, quick little tip on that. If you have a dialog box off screen, hold the Alt key and spacebar. You should see where it says move close. If you select move, hit an arrow key it should bring this back to be able to be moved. So you know, set this to architectural. We'll go ahead and do that. So now when I do a distance on this, it's going to be based on that new unit. So now it's 10 inches. Well, what if I insert something that's 100 millimeters or 100 centimeters? Well, that's where we have to use a scale factor. Like Damon mentioned, the common scale factors for imperial to metric or metric to imperial are really going to pay off. To me, reference is going to be one of the most easy features to do. So yes, set your units and then insert the object, even whatever units that insert as. You can change the insertion units by going back to the units command. Um, I would be very careful with that. Oh, cool, my dialog box opened off screens. So I could actually show this. Uh, Alt space bar, you can't really see it, unfortunately, because I got two screens. And my other one's super secret. So uh, here it is. You can see Alt Space Bar. I'll do it over here just so you can see it. If it's off screen, Alt and Space Bar, you get this. Move close, move. You see this little button. Hit an arrow key. Boom, there it is. Now you can see it can move it off screen, back on screen. It actually comes up quite a bit. So um, especially in this day and age where everybody has like 18 monitors. 
So um, yeah, reference. So when you insert, remember, objects have an insertion uh, scale. This is based on generally the very one times the object's size. Uh, it's not based on the units in your units for the insertion scale. And it really likes to set that on my other monitor. That's okay. Insertion scale. I don't try to set this anything different. If you do set it different and hit OK, you'll get this warning uh, telling you you should put this back to inches. Are you sure you want to do that? Most of the time, you don't want to do that. So keeping it as whatever the units are specified. If you go to decimal, however, and switch to millimeters and hit OK, no warning at all, which is very good if you're trying to work in metric and you don't want to use that. So. Uh, insert and then scale by scale factor and use the inch to metric conversion. So, um, um, is that a one more, uh, what's the difference between match properties and scale text? I mean, which one's better or why would I use one or the other? That's a good point and a good question. Um, oftentimes what I find the difference too is Scale text is a very specific command targeted at the object's size relative to its location. Uh, match properties, so if I were to set this to red and set the, um, let's just say the align type to you know, something or whatever, especially with text, it's going to be a little bit different because they don't have a line type. Anyway, um, if the justification was top right for this guy, and let's just put a mask on it because masks are cool. Um, so if we do this, we have a frame. If I were to you know, have this guy be six, but I want the text size to be the same and I match properties, well, that's what it's gonna do. But if I scale text and pick them both, and I say use their existing points, which would be top right, top left, I can then say make them both six, and they're both six. So very good if you have multiple text styles, fonts, sizes, et cetera, and you're trying to make them all larger size. I really like it for justifications. Um, notes work very well for this. Oftentimes they have just, just justification text on the objects that are middle center of a room, et cetera. It works very well to have that uh, be the case because match properties will match very specific properties, um, meaning pretty much everything. So whereas scale text is just targeted at the size text. Thank you. Hey, uh, can we run the last poll because we have one minute left? Yes, that's what I was getting to. All right, so I'm gonna switch back to PowerPoint. Awesome. Additional resources. Thanks for joining again, everybody. Let's run the last poll before I let you guys go. And I'll actually post this one. Uh, did you guys learn something new today? Awesome. What? Some people did not learn something new. Well, I think I'm just going to call it for the day. I'm going to go home and probably cry a little bit over not being able to teach everybody something new. So let's go ahead and uh, I'm going to close that poll and share it. 98% of you learned something new. One person maybe didn't. That's probably Naman. No, he actually, I that. learned something new today myself. <laughs> I mean, every time I watch these, I learn something new because you can't keep up with everything. Yeah, you know, AutoCAD is an old program, but there is so much to it. Um, and everybody does a lot of different things. Um, that's one of the beauties of it to me and one of the most fascinating things. Thank you everybody for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and shut off the broadcast again, join us next month, September 14th. And that will be, let me refresh myself. Let's see blocks, attributes, dynamic blocks and AutoCAD 2018. I am sure you guys will cover scale in there too. Make sure to bug whoever is presenting that webinar with more scale questions. So thank you, everybody, for joining us, and have a good rest of your day.